Okay, hello everybody, and you're very welcome to tonight's webinar. You need me and I need space, something that probably many of us parents have had uh, experience with. And we are very lucky to have Kelsey Olds again, the occupational therapist. Uh, we're delighted to have you again, Casey. Thank you, or Kelsey. Thank you so much. Already stuttering. Um, so um, I am recording this so that you know those of you that are in the audience. And if you feel like you have a question for Kelsey, put it into the chat. Uh, often the same question comes up a couple times. So I'll kind of scan those, and for the end, I'll provide Kelsey with a kind of um anonymous few questions that she can answer for everybody because we can't really answer specific questions in this format. So I hope that's okay for you. I'll be watching the chat. And um, thank you so much to Rethink also, who is the reason that we can do this stuff for free. Um, so I'm delighted you're all here and I'm gonna turn this over to Kelsey now. All right. Uh, I just finished getting my own children with intense connection needs down to bed, uh, like, uh, like 10 minutes ago so uh i'm turning off the part of my brain that's listening for uh people coming out of their bedrooms <laughs> handing that over to my to my partner for the evening i remember thinking with my first child that i was really good at cultivating opportunities for independent play um because he would happily play with his own thing for like minutes at a time hours at a time while i went around getting stuff done that i needed to get done I was not one of those parents who thinks they know everything, I promise. Uh, I was quite worried about a lot of things uh, and working hard to unlearn old patterns, but this one I really felt like I had on lock. Teaching kids to play by themselves. Step one, have a kid. Step two, they play by themselves. <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say is I would have been perfect at delivering this talk in 2019. Completely foolproof, complete expert, 100% success rate on every child I'd ever parented. And then my second was born. Uh, I think some kids just come out koalas. I think sometimes clinginess comes from trauma or neurodivergence. And uh, I think sometimes it's really just a personality thing. Everybody needs human connection, but some kids need it every day. Like they need nutrition and vitamins and some kids need it like every second, like they need air. My daughter is very uh, sensory seeking. She knows exactly what she wants. She knows how to chase it. She would like a great deal of touch, a great deal of movement, a great deal of sound, um, a great deal of visual input. She would like to eat something crunchy every minute of the day. Uh, I am pretty intensely sensory avoidant. And as a side note, if these uh, phrases sensory seeking and sensory avoidant and uh, don't mean anything to you, or you want to know more about that, I don't have the time in this presentation to go into depth with what the sensory profiles are, but I put a little screenshot of what it looks like on my website. If you go to occupational.com, I've got a free uh, webinar where I explain the sensory profiles um, in the recordings and media section. I would like to not be touched except in very small and specific quantities. I would like it to be quiet for about half the day unless I spend the first nine hours of my day at work. Then I'm yearning for quiet by the time that I'm home. I would like to be relatively sedentary. Uh, and all of this mismatch between me and what my what my child needs uh, is coming from one lens, the sensory lens. I could put a different lens on uh, and I could think about my uh, like childhood beliefs about families, how families ought to be, how much is normal to hug and kiss and touch, of course, with like big, big air quotes around the word normal there, how much noise is expected in a household. If I put a different lens on, I could look at this through the lens of like felt safety versus threat. How much noise makes my body feel like it's in danger? How much touch begins to feel as if I'm being attacked? I could look at this through still more lenses. These aren't intended to be exhaustive. These are just giving a different kind of scope of all the, the, the ways that I can look at this. I could look at the lens of respect. I could look at the lens of trauma. I can look at the lens of attachment, the lens of meeting needs. These are all different frameworks through which I could look at my kid and look at myself and recognize that there's some kind of mismatch. And it's in this mismatch that this becomes a problem because clinginess or intense connection needs isn't a problem really if the other person wants to cling to you as much as you want to cling to them. That might be a very intense relationship. Uh, and things could change over time, but looking at something at a moment in time when both people are like willingly equally participating, that's fantastic. That's not a problem at all. 
any problem here in this realm that we're talking about comes from mismatch. So I'm going to try to use the word mismatch instead of the word problem throughout the rest of this talk, because to me, that's more specific. Our kid isn't a problem. We are also not a problem. No one in this scenario is a problem. We just don't match. And, and that's what it is that we're, that we're trying to solve. So maybe you recognized yourself in some of what I'm describing, or maybe you recognized your partner uh, or, or someone else who you co-parent with in some of what I was describing, somewhere in the sensory processing, somewhere in the feeling like your home life when you were a child had maybe one set of expectations and now you are hoping to create different ones. Um, somewhere in your definition of respect or uh, traumas that you or your child or both of you have experienced. Somewhere in things that you've read or heard about attachment. There's lots of things about that on uh, the internet uh, and things about brains, things about how brains grow. Somewhere in your family, you all need to get your needs met. And um, one thing that I think is helpful in solving this mismatch, as well as a lot of other things in, uh, you could take this framework and kind of apply it to a lot of areas, is that um, like unclumping the problem or taking it apart into smaller parts to try to figure out which of the smaller parts is the one that's affecting you directly. Because the more language we have to describe what it is that uh, we're struggling with, whether it's a mismatch, whether it's a problem in a different area, the more precise of language we can describe, the easier, the more steps we've already taken towards solving that. So if I, in my job as occupational therapist in the schools, if I have a teacher come to me and say, a kid keeps freaking out of my class and all the detail they can give me is a kid keeps freaking out of my class, I don't have anything to go off of with that. Uh, do they mean crying? Do they mean punching them in the face? Do they mean running out of the room? You know, I, I, need, I need details uh, to be able to, to start pinning it down. And it's the same with this mismatch or with this talking about a kid who's being needy or a kid who is clingy or a kid who's intense or a kid with intense connection needs, whatever word you use to describe it, if that's as far of the language as you can manage, if then um, you don't have it specific enough to be able to solve that. One parent might say, my kid is very clingy and needy. And what they mean is that their child wants physical contact with them all day and that their body feels touched out. One parent might say, my kid is very clingy and needy, and they mean my child wants to talk to me all day, and uh, I'm tired, like I'm tapped out on hearing it. One parent might say, my kid is very clingy and needy, and mean my kid asks me so many questions, and it's like putting a language demand on me. One parent might say, my kid is very clingy and needy, and mean my child struggles with separating from me, so when they go to daycare or when they go to school or stay with a babysitter, then they cry and they, they, they scream, and, and it's hard for us to separate. One parent might say, my kid is very clingy and needy and mean. My child always wants me to play with them, like a play partner. One parent might say, my child is very clingy and needy and mean. My kid has huge emotional reactions. They seem outsized compared to other kids that I know, and they're frequent, and they're throughout the day, and I'm the only person who they can co-regulate with. And there again, this isn't like exhaustive. There could be other things that people mean when they say this, and... Um, there could also be more than one thing. Maybe you mean my kid is literally all six of these, you know, how do I even start? But I think that um, that having the language uh, is the start because then you can, uh, you might be able to solve one of these or prioritize one of these and then, you know, get triage, get to the other ones when you can get to them um, and, and feel like you're making progress instead of just like your whole personality is so much and I'm so tapped out and I don't even know where to begin, then that's like acting as if the child, who they are is a problem. And so instead we're trying to find um, specific descriptors or specific um, um, scenarios that it is that we're, that we're talking about. So uh, figuring out the definition of clingy or needy or has intense connection needs is probably the first step. What does it look like for them? What does it look like for you? I want to picture it from the flip side, from the child's point of view. We might hear different things if we were able to ask our children and if they were able to perfectly articulate in a completely adult, understandable way. One child might say, I need my parent because I'm scared. Another might say, I need my dad because he understands me like no one else does. Another might say, I need my mom because I'm bored and she makes everything delightful. Another might say, I need my baba because I'm extroverted. I'd prefer to play with somebody than to play alone. Another might say, I need my grandma because she knows everything there is to know and I don't know how else to find things out. I'm giving away my own strategy with a hint in that last one because I have this theory about 
all behavior, any behavior that's not working for, for somebody, for everybody, can be addressed with this sort of three-step problem-solving method. So uh, if, if I could state the problem as the child does X in Y location, which is not working for Z reason, then any solution that I come up with is going to follow this pattern. The child needs a time and a place to do X. The child needs a substitute thing that meets their needs in Y location. And the child and the adult need to be able to communicate about Z reason, assuming that X is not inherently harmful in and of itself, just not working out due to like location or other factors. So I mentioned as my fifth example of a thing that a child might say, I need my grandma because she knows everything there is to know and I don't know how else to find things out. I give my own strategy away a little bit. A big part of helping that particular child is gonna be creating other ways in which they can ask questions, creating other ways in which they can figure things out that don't involve talking to grandma every single second of the day where grandma is already feeling overwhelmed and would like to like tone things down a little bit. If I were going to take that exact example and plug it into my formula, I would end up with a result that sounded like this. The child needs a time and a place to ask unlimited questions. The child needs a way to get their questions answered or remembered for later during dinner time while grandma is trying to focus on cooking. Uh, the adult and the child need to be able to communicate about how grandma needs to be able to think while she's cooking. And it's tricky for her to do that with questions coming at her. That's, uh, I, I chose an example that's probably not the primary thing that people think of asking questions when they think of um, a child with intense connection needs, but I chose it because it's a really concrete one for giving an example of a way that um, you could plug it into this formula and come up with a solution. It's not an immediate solution to all problems, but what it does is help us frame it in a way that makes it more breakdownable, more understandable, more able to wrap our heads around exactly what the problem is, instead of just feeling vaguely overwhelmed at all times, <laughs> which is an emotion that I can very strongly relate to. Um, so then after we've broken it down, we still have things to ask ourselves. Like, where can my child ask unlimited questions that will work for me and also work for them? It doesn't work for them if you're like at a time that they don't have any questions. Right when you wake up, you can ask me all the questions you can think of. Well, I haven't thought of any. I'm still tired. Um, another big component of this, in addition to taking the adult's concerns into consideration, taking the child's concern into consideration, uh, a big component of this is understanding what is developmentally appropriate of this particular child at this particular uh, time and phase in their life for me to ask of them. So I'm gonna leave the questions example behind for a second and go to a different example that I gave. A uh, child who screams and cries when they're being dropped off at daycare. Well, if a, five, a parent of a five-year-old was asking me, it would be very different from if a parent of a 15-month-old was asking me because a parent of a 15-month-old, when this is happening, they're in the peak of a separation anxiety phase. Developmentally speaking, that's going to be the time in a child's life when they uh, developmentally typically have the most anxiety around separating from their caregiver. So you could come up with a million substitutes and strategies and do everything in the world just like just right. And the fact is that a 15 month old will very likely cry and scream when they're in the phase for crying and screaming when you leave them with somebody else. Does that mean that you can't leave them? No. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that. Uh, I'm showing the limitations of the problem solving strategy here. There's no way to like plug that one into a problem solving strategy because it's just describing the result of a natural phase in child development. The child needs a way to scream and cry at a different place. Not really. The child is stressed out when I leave. That's unacceptable for the reason that it's hard for me. No, that's not gonna work. Um, we're in the business of allowing all emotions around here, which means even the uncomfortable ones are allowed. The best thing that you can do in a scenario like that is be leaving your child with someone who's supportive and going to co-regulate with them and understands what kind of a phase they're in and isn't freaked out by it, just like you're not freaked out by it because both of you know that this is just them at where they're at and that, you know, they're going to encounter things that make them uncomfortable in life and that that's not the end of the world. Um, so a lot of times reading about child development can really help in this area. I know that most people have not gone through child development training of any kind. And so just hearing this is normal at this age, this is normal at that age can make a really big difference. Um, 
So in the interest of saying this is normal at this age and this is normal at that age, I'm going to go through a, a few things that are that are normals here. Um, I'm gonna talk through a little bit of uh, normal. You could also say typical if you don't like the word normal. Typical social development, typical physical development uh, or sensory development, typical play development and typical emotional development. Um, and I don't have the time in one evening to actually give you a primer on literally every age of development that children go through. So I'm going to be speaking in kind of uh, generalities. And then uh, I can name some resources for you that you can read in more depth uh, to figure out what applies to you, what applies to your child. So social development, when it comes to social development, how many questions can this small person possibly ask me? A lot. Some kids, uh, usually in the three to six-ish age range, will ask the same question a billion times in a row or ask a bunch of questions that are so basic that they are mind-numbingly boring to you because they are trying to make conversation with you. They don't know how to say, keep talking to me about this thing. I like to hear your voice. I'm interested in what you're saying. You're basically my favorite person. Can you tell me more? So instead, they just either like ask the same question over and over again or ask a like super dull series of questions because they don't know what kind of prompts you ask to keep an entertaining conversation going. They might be like, what are you making for dinner? What's that? Why does it look like that? What are you holding? What are you stirring? Is that a spoon? What are you putting in there? And uh, what they're trying to do is just to, to engage you in conversation. The problem is that the, the mismatch is that uh, ad adults are usually like get so tapped out by that type of intense questioning that they'll that they'll switch to just giving the most bare bones like basic one word answers that you can and then the child's like okay i've got to try harder to get them to be engaged and and it's it's a mismatch some kids usually a little younger maybe in the three to six ish age range will ask a bunch of questions because they are learning to predict the answer to a question they are learning to per, like hypothesize into the future. What is it that you're going to say? So they ask a question that they can already hypothesize the answer to and listen to see whether they were right. Is that what you say? This is a really helpful skill later in life. I might hypothesize that if I ask my boss, hey, can I call it a night a little early? I've finished up everything I've planned for this week. They're more likely to be like, yes, go home, have a great weekend. Then if I'm like, hey, boss, can I go home and take a nap? I'm bored. Both of those things might be true statements, but one is considered a more socially appropriate way of, of talking about things. And I can guess as to how they'll be received because I've had a lot of practice at asking questions where I'm guessing what the other person is going to say and then checking to see if I'm right. How is it going to be received? How does this work socially? What sort of uh, factors in this sentence that I'm saying are, are of a concern to the other party? Predicting allows me to do a lot of nuanced things. I can change my wording to be appropriate in different contexts. I can anticipate someone else's needs and try to take care of them. I can understand that something is wrong or unusual if I get a wildly different answer than I was expecting. So if your kid who obviously like knows what a spoon is, is standing next to you making dinner and is like, is that a spoon? Are you going to stir that? Now are you going to put it in the oven? They're probably trying to predict whether they can guess correctly what it is that you're going to say. The yes, yes, they already know the answer. They're both making conversation and predicting the answer. Some kids of all ages ask a lot of questions when they're looking for safety or comfort or stability. This is very common with children who have anxiety or children who have come from traumatic places. Their brain doesn't necessarily perceive the world around them as being safe and predictable. So they're testing out its safety and predictability by asking questions that they should probably know the answer to. So you're like, hey, we're going to go to Sarah's house in 10 minutes. And they're like, who's Sarah? Where's her house? Where are we going? Why are we going there? How are we going to get there? And you're like, we do this every week at the same time. What are you talking about? When they ask a question and they can guess what the right answer is going to be, and then you give the right answer, it gives their brain like a little burst of like safety and assuredness until it wears off. And then they ask something else to try to achieve that again. Some children, especially on the younger end, but also older, especially if they have any uh, like language or speech difficulties, might ask a lot of questions as they are learning about speech and language. They're figuring out how to clarify things in different ways. What kinds of ways do people string words together? Um, it's a skill for people to word something in a different way if they're not understood. When a toddler very first learns to speak, they'll just usually just like declare gibberish at you. And if you're like, what? They don't know that what means you should clarify in some way or repeat yourself. That's a skill that they acquire over time. 
but it doesn't stop there. It keeps refining. So if I say, blah, 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 and you say, pardon, then I don't just say, blah, 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 blah. I might change the way that I worded it, or I might speak more loudly and more clearly or slowly or present it in a different way. So I say, can you hand me the green bowl? And my partner says, sorry, what was that? And I say, the, the green one, the bowl right over there, can you hand that to me? Children also have to learn this skill. And so sometimes intense questioning, intense over and over can be them practicing saying things in different ways to see if all the ways still work. I realized my daughter was doing this one when uh, she, uh, what I was working on doing the laundry and she was standing beside me and going, um, you're doing the laundry? Yeah. You're washing the shirts? Yeah. You're cleaning the underwear? Yeah. <laughs> you're washing the socks? And I was like, oh my gosh, stop conversing with me this way until I realized she was like taking a moment to like check her definition of everything that she's swapping out in that conversation. And then uh, some children, especially neurodivergent children, like uh, autistic or ADHD children, may use a strategy called polling, which is asking the same question of the same person or of multiple people at different times throughout the day or when you encounter the person as a sort of way to gauge how you're doing with that person at that time. You get clues from the other person's tone of voice, the way they answer, all those kinds of things. You can imagine like uh, two hypothetical uh, like elderly men in the same town and George walks by Chester's house every day at eight and he says, how's it going, Chester? And Chester says, it's going, George, it's going. And uh, it's serving a connection purpose for both of them. They have this script that they run at each other every day. And it's just like a little, a little connection. Now imagine that one day George goes, how's it going, Chester? And Chester goes, get the heck off my lawn. Well, okay, that's a clear sign that there's something wrong. Maybe Chester needs help. Maybe George has done something to offend him in some way. Um, the connection between the two of them is severed for some reason, and somebody might need help from somebody. That's what kids are doing when they're polling. They ask the same question over and over, uh, especially when it's a non-question question or a part of a script, and it has the same playful answer. Um, it serves a connection purpose, and it acts, it acts as a gauge to try to figure out what one or both parties involved in the poll might need. Does knowing these normals about questioning mean we can never ever be annoyed by our child asking us perpetual questions? No, it does not. I am annoyed all of the time at my child asking me perpetual questions. Does it mean that we can never redirect our child or ask them to stop or find a substitute to meet their need? No, it does not. But it does help us keep in mind what's typical and what's outside the range of typical. That might help us understand what our child is doing. It might help us to be more realistic in our expectations of them and so on. So if we suspect that our child is probably trying to meet a need for conversation, then we can meet them in that by prompting them in conversation or keeping the conversation going. Um, and in a way that doesn't involve asking endless questions because <laughs> adults often do that to children and then are surprised when the child thinks that the right way to converse is to ask endless questions. So we can um, comment on what it is that we're doing or explain it out loud. Or if they're older, maybe say something like, hey, tell me more about that thing you said you were interested in the other day or, or something like that. If we suspect that our child might be like wondering about lots of things, we could try setting them up with a, um, an educational podcast, a YouTube channel that we trust, a, a show that asks wondering questions and answers them. If we suspect that our child is like studying the way that dialogue works by asking the same things in different ways, maybe they'll respond better to shows or videos or audiobooks or podcasts that involve two people conversing rather than, for example, YouTube shows where one person is just talking to the screen. If we think that our kids are looking for safety and reassurance, then we can maybe find a way to help them uh, find that and hold on to that. We could write down an answer for them. Uh, we could uh, teach them to record their own voices on some kind of technology. We could take a picture of an answer for them. We could acknowledge the anxiety that we're hearing from them by naming it out loud instead of by brushing past it. Like, yes, we're going to go to Sarah's house, our friend. We go see her every week. Are you feeling nervous about it? You're asking me a lot of questions. So uh, I'm going to move on to kind of uh, typical sensory development. And I'm going to talk a little bit with you about proprioceptive needs. Um, proprioception may or may not be a word that you've ever heard of before. It's one of the types of senses that people have, like the five senses. Um, 
And um, you probably didn't learn about it in school as one of the five senses. Proprioception is the sense of your body in space. Um, it is, uh, think about, it's, it's, it's stimulated by deep pressure. If you think about the difference between somebody like lightly running their hand over your arm versus squeezing it, those are two different sensations. You can feel the touch sensation of a hand touching your arm, but the squeeze sensation is deeper. It's inside your body, inside your muscles. Proprioception can be something that very touchy, clingy children are seeking out. That's because where other types of sensory input, like vision or hearing or smell or taste, are often liked or disliked by different people. Proprioception is almost universally very regulating and soothing to people. Children seek out loads of proprioception for their developing bodies to stay regulated, to develop a better sense of their body in space, to keep their attention on things, and also just because it feels good. So there are different categories of proprioception. Uh, this is uh, uh, a framework that I described, so this isn't something that um, is coming from uh, a source other than just me describing it from my own brain. The proprioception stuff is, but the uh, breakdown is just me. Um, exertion proprioception, impact proprioception, and pressure proprioception is how I conceptualize these things. So exertion is anything that involves using your muscles, pushing, pulling, lifting, climbing, hanging, tensing. I mean, everything involves using your muscles, but I mean like in a very physically exertive way. Um, impact proprioception is like wrestling, falling, jumping, running, hitting, kicking, banging, anything that involves impact. And then pressure proprioception is like squeezing, leaning, draping, heavy weight on you, holding or keeping something on or in that body part to sort of wake it up. Pressure is usually the most difficult to kind of conceptualize for somebody who hasn't heard anything about this before. Um, some examples of ways that I like uh, uh, clinically address pressure proprioception needs can sometimes help visualize what it is a little bit more. So wearing a weighted vest, using a weighted blanket, using a spandex uh, or squeeze blanket or shirt or sheet, um, wearing a heavy coat even when it's not cold because you like the pressure of it, keeping an object held in your hand all the time to wake it up, wanting to wear shoes all the time, getting a tight squeezy hug, rolling up in blankets, burying yourself in cushions. These are some things that people do when they're seeking out pressure proprioception. Kids who are wanting hugs all the time or wanting to keep a hand or foot touching you all the time are often looking for pressure proprioception in addition to the emotional need that they're feeling, which is totally valid and its own thing. They're also meeting a physical level, real sensory need. Kids who are wanting really like aggressive, squeezy, lovey, crashy physical input, uh, can my, they might be like running up to you and tackle hugging you or even more aggressive things like hitting or wrestling. They might be looking for impact or exertion proprioception. Sometimes the type of proprioception that people seek out might vary with the emotion that they're experiencing. So usually when people are, um, uh, again, this is just based on my own experiences and observations, but what I've observed is when people are feeling angry, they might seek out exertion, flip a table, or impact, hit something. When people are feeling fearful, they might seek out exertion to try to calm themselves, like run, 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 run really fast, far away. Um, when people are uh, feeling silly, silly dysregulated, not just silly good, but silly in like a out of control kind of way, um, then they might seek out exertion or impact proprioception. When people are in pain, they might seek out impact hitting the body part to try to like, like out of desperation or hitting a different body part to distract from it. Or they might seek out pressure, squeezing the body part or squeezing themselves or seeking out a hug. And when people are sad, then they seem like they typically seek out pressure proprioception. So sometimes finding a way to help meet your kid where they're at, meet their needs and solve this mismatch could be on a very physical level. Especially if you could tell when you're like looking inward, assessing yourself, that having a little bit more physical removal from the situation might let you stay more emotionally connected. So what I mean by this, one way that this looks in my house is I can tell my kids would really be thriving right now with my full emotional attention. 
They're bidding for my attention. They're trying to do it by climbing on me and touching me and hugging me and wrestling me. And I can feel in myself, I will be able to be more emotionally available for them for a longer time if I can stop my body from being touched. Because the brain part of me feels like, yeah, I get it. I love you. I want to hang out. But the body part of me feels like, oh my gosh, stop touching me. I can't handle any more of this. So if I grab a big teddy bear and I make the teddy bear start wrestling with them, then they can roll around and flip around on the floor and punch the bear and freak out and throw it in the air and let land on them and all of that. And they're getting the proprioception and I'm over there maybe doing a silly voice for the bear or I'm helping hold the bear and make it jump on them. Or I'm um, being on their team and being like, bear, stop jumping on my kids. And, and so I'm being emotionally available. I'm being emotionally a part of it and connected with them. So I'm meeting that connection need. I'm not saying outsource this to something else, but I'm getting to remove my body from it. And I'm not having to physically meet the proprioception need just because I'm also there to meet the emotional need. I also throw pillows and blankets at them or start a pillow fight or squish them with a bean bag or just be like cannonball and just chuck a couch cushion and it lands on their head or a lot of, lot of different ways. Or uh, we put a bunch of blankets on top of us and lay down and watch a movie or, or something like that. So it's like, we're all seeking this pressure together. This pressure is for you to meet your proprioceptive needs. Um, and I don't have to, with my own human body, meet your proprioceptive needs. So giving a little primer on play development, uh, I'm going to uh, run real quickly through just kind of different, these are not exhaustive. There are about 16 different types of play if you categorize them all, and I'm not going to run through all of them. I'm going to run through the ones that feel like they're the most relevant. So um, locomotor play is playing with movement for movement's sake. Babies can uh, at first only really do locomotor play. They can't really do any other form of play until they get slightly older than, than newborn. It develops pretty fast, but newborns come out being able to locomotor play. They're like, I will roll over just because it is cool to face this way. Now I will move my arm just because, oh my gosh, an arm just moved. Like I will learn to scoot around and crawl just because it's so cool to move my hands and knees at the same time. Uh, locomotor play can involve struggle and frustration, uh, and letting that be a part of it is important. Play isn't always 100% happy all of the time, and that's important. Then uh, when babies get into toddler years, locomotor play starts getting on a larger scale. Uh, the climbing up on chairs, climbing up, balancing on curbs, climbing up new playground equipment. And again, it still involves struggle at this stage. Um, and, um, and just like exploring what it is that your body can do. What, what does it feel like? What, where am I in space in relation to these things? How much of myself can I lift? How far can I climb? Um, gaining these body skills through struggle is super important. But then there are lots of other forms of play too, other than just locomotor play. Toddlers also do a lot of exploratory play, which is play that involves throwing things, banging things, dropping things. Um, uh, adults might put a stop to that because toddlers don't know the difference between what objects are a good idea for throwing and what objects are a bad idea for throwing. But rather than putting a stop to it, the best thing to do is to redirect it to the right kind of object for that. Um, it's a developmentally normal play phase. The child is supposed to go through it. Um, toddlers will do a lot of object play where they are closely examining, exploring objects. How do those objects interact with other objects? They might find some small random thing that isn't even a toy and become fascinated by it. This is the age where they'll like become obsessed with a remote and take it to bed with them or become, you know, the spray bottle is their new favorite thing in the whole entire world. Um, they might try to take things apart to see what's inside of them. They might put things together in unique ways. This is very basic to us because we did that kind of play when we were toddlers. They're laying the foundations for being able to come up with creative problem solving skills later in life and understanding all the foundation of things later in life. Then as children get into the preschool years, like three to five-ish age range, maybe a little bit later than that, maybe four to six, there's even more types of play that they start exploring. Preschoolers do a lot of rough and tumble play, like uh, wrestling pretending to hit or fight, but not actually intending to hit or fight. Um, and um, in many contexts, like school or daycare, they may not be allowed to do that, which it is understandable as long as the adults keep in mind that it is developmentally normal for them to want to do it and to keep trying to do it because they're following their body's normal development. 
it means that uh, at home they definitely need to get access to rough and tumble play of some kind. Um, preschoolers do tons of role play and sociodramatic play, which is two forms of acting out things that they see in real life. They make sense of the world around them by pretending to act like moms and dads, like teachers, like doctors, like people who can drive a car, uh, people who work at shops, people who give haircuts. Their brains are asking and sorting out all kinds of questions like, what is the essential nature of this activity? What do grown-ups gain from engaging in this activity? What's important about it? How are other people involved? Why does society work the way it does? What part do I play in all of this? Closely related, uh, preschoolers do a lot of imaginative and fantasy play with make-believe elements and saying things that aren't really real. Children this age are often still uh, exploring the difference between what's real and what's fantasy, so they often believe what it is that they're talking about. Toddlers, preschoolers, and elementary, uh, primary school uh, on up will all do creative play, but it often looks very different across the lifespan. Toddlers and preschoolers may gravitate more toward process art, where they're just using creative materials for the sake of exploring the material. Older children are more interested in product art, where they have a finished product in their mind and they're using the art to try to get to the point where they've finished and created that end product. A couple of types of play are more evident mainly in older kids, uh, uh, usually like later primary school on through teenage and even adulthood. Communicative play and social play both involve playing with words, making jokes, lots of verbal things. This could involve communicating to complete a shared goal, figuring out the rules of a game together, verbally planning what it is that you want to build out of building materials. Um, uh, a lot of adults will like play games where from a object play perspective, everybody's just holding a bunch of cards and then occasionally laying one down in the middle. That's not very interesting object play. The interesting part of it is the social play, the communicative play. The, the cards might have funny things written on them or the cards might have numbers written on them and there could be, you know, uh, uh, cool rules that you're following to see who can win. So there's all of these forms of play that happen across the span of childhood. And play takes many different forms, and uh, all the different forms are the child's brain learning something foundational that it needs to know to build up into higher skills. And what this can help with is if you recognize your child in one of these categories more strongly than in others, um, or if you recognize a play category that your child loves but you don't love, then you can make uh, plans for those specific play needs to be met by a different way. That could be a play date with a peer. That could be um, a, a partner or someone else in your life who does like that type of play. That could be um, a lot of different things. And if you're feeling like your child needs you to be their play partner 100% of the time, then knowing different types of play and knowing language around it can help you figure out what to do in order to meet the, con again, meeting the connection need, the emotional part of the need from, from asking you to be their play partner without having to like martyr yourself with something that isn't, is, is feeling like it's not meeting your needs. So an example of that in my life is it feels much easier to me to do locomotor play, moving my body, than it does for me to do role play. I can feel my brain melting out of my head when I have to make a stuffed animal pretend to go to school for the 400th time. But I can invite my child to a dance party or to watch a Danny Go like dance video. It feels way easier to me. And so if my child is saying, play with me, play with me, play with me, play with me, I know that I can offer either when she's asking or preemptively, I will play this with you. I don't, I don't want to play that, or I'm not interested in playing that, or I will watch you play that, but I don't want to play. I don't really want to be a cat going to school. I will watch a Danny Go video with you and do a dance. It also feels way easier to me to do um, creative play than it does to do object play. My daughter likes to sort beads into 10 million little special piles, and they all have thoughts in her head about them, and sometimes she tries to explain me the thoughts, and then I get the beads wrong because... I'm not the one who loves sorting the beads into the special piles intensely. That's what she loves. Um, if I can do something creative, like have my own beads and I sort them by color or I make a pattern or I put them on a string and make a bracelet while I'm watching her do that, I'm doing creative play. She's doing object play or I'm, or I can offer 
do you want to make bracelets with me instead? That helps me stay regulated. And then the bid for connection that she's asking for, she's saying play with me because she wants mom to hang out with her. And I can say, yes, here's where I can meet you at. I, 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 you know, I don't expect the five-year-old to be able to um, know how to perfectly ask me for a connection in a way that meets both of our needs. I can counter suggest, I think that this would meet both of our needs because I can see what it is you need. And I can also articulate what it is that I need. I also wanted to mention the idea of parallel play, which is when two people are side by side or in the same room and they're both hanging out and doing their own separate thing. And I would encourage parents of older kids to cultivate parallel play intentionally where you're doing your hobby or your thing and they're doing theirs. They won't be good at it at first. <laughs> Nobody is. Don't get yourself like invested in a hobby that you can't bear to tear yourself away from or it makes you feel worse or mentally worse if um, you get interrupted in it. Your goal for like maybe the first 10 times might be just to model I'm doing my hobby. You're doing your hobby. We're hanging out. This is still connection. Um, but not expecting yet to get rest and, and recuperation from it. In our family, this has like barely started emerging around four or five-ish and started getting stronger around five, six-ish. And that's how old my kids are. So I can't tell you beyond that. Um, but some kids might struggle with it until later in life too, because kids develop skills at different ages. So what this has looked like in our house is me intentionally reading a physical book around my kids. And I actually prefer to read a Kindle book uh, on my phone, on the Kindle app, but my kids can't tell the difference between mom is looking at their phone because they are reading a book and mom is looking at their phone because they're bored of us and, and talking to their friends. So instead I bring a physical book into the room and intentionally read it around my kids. Um, and the first many times they just interrupted me constantly. And over time we built the idea that I can be here. I'm, I'm going to watch you do, you know, five cool jumps on the trampoline. And then I'm going to read my book for a little bit. And then we'll keep like checking back in with each other. Um, I've invited them to go on nature walks with me. I've invited them to do other types of, uh, like, um, uh, I, they have, we have a cheap little laptop. And so sometimes they like to set up next to me and type things on Microsoft word. They're just typing random gibberish and I'm typing occupational therapist posts. Uh, and we're both, uh, parallel playing together. Um, on some days, my most intense connection needs kid has a harder time with this than on other days. On some days, me trying to parallel play next to her just means that everybody will melt down. Um, and sometimes all I can do is remind myself, that one important thing that I'm doing is showing them grownups have needs too. Grownups do meaningful things for fun for ourselves. All of that isn't just hidden away until after bedtime or like out of sight. I'm showing them that I, that I write things for fun, that I draw things for fun, that all of these, you know, human things are things that I do also that I'm a human too. Um, and so I think that it's worth intentionally trying to cultivate when you can. And then the last section of normals that I wanted to talk about is uh, emotional development or the way that self-regulation develops in kids. Are the big feelings supposed to be this big? Humans are inherently social creatures. We are so social that being around someone who is regulated in their body plus enough time is all it takes to get regulated in our body. Our body will unconsciously match their breathing, their heart rate, our body will realize that it's not in danger, it's not under threat, and it will stop putting out the panic hormones that make us want to fight or run away. Have you ever been very upset and then had a person that you love just hold space for you until your body has had time to calm? They might have physically hugged you or held you. They might have just sat beside you. They might have held your hand. Maybe you cried. Maybe you raged. Maybe you just sat there in shock. But you're not still doing that right now. So with time, the emotion passed, you were able to think again, you might've been able to try to do something to address the situation. It might not have been a situation that had anything that could be done about it, but eventually you were able to choose to go get some food or get some water because you had to keep existing. Adults co-regulate too. Kids are not the only ones who co-regulate, although they often need it as their primary coping strategy, where for adults, it might be one of many. Kids with intense connection needs might be leaning really hard on co-regulating with their adult through every single thing, every moment of the day. When their adult is away or when their adult is even just out of the room, 
they have a hard time carrying that connection through to remember that the regulation, the connection is going to last, is going to stay with them, is going to come back again. This can come from trauma. This can also just come from personality types. Self-regulation is a big skill made out of a lot of little skills. Uh, and we learn them from going through this process over and over, from trial and error, from the modeling of people around us. Uh, but one thing that we can only learn ourselves by experiencing it over and over is that emotions are survivable. We live through anxiety, sadness, excitement, fear, frustration. We survive it. We survive all of it. Feelings are wonderful and powerful and huge. And the process of learning to tolerate them uh, while still... I'm so sorry, Kelsey. <laughs> That's okay. I got it. While still keeping hold of um, your logic brain is challenging. And uh, children do this a massive amount of the time through play. They co-regulate with us to learn to strengthen this skill. And they also repeatedly play over and over and over. Wrestling, rough and tumble play, builds self-regulation. Playing with risky tools and materials builds self-regulation. Playing freely with sensory-rich materials builds self-regulation. Playing socially with others, fighting, arguing, bickering builds self-regulation. Getting loud, yelling, moving through a range of volumes up and down builds self-regulation. Trying to do hard things that you can't do yet, that you yourself chose and are motivated to do, builds self-regulation. Sensory-rich stims and fidgeting and play and self-soothing techniques are self-regulation tools. Picking things apart is a self-regulation tool. Sucking and chewing on and mouthing things is a self-regulation tool. Stomping your feet is a self-regulation tool. Yelling is a self-regulation tool. Crying is a self-regulation tool. Picking up a heavy thing and flipping it over or throwing it is a self-regulation tool. Throwing yourself on the ground and feeling a hard impact is a self-regulation tool. Running around, rolling, flipping, somersaulting, wiggling is a self-regulation tool. And a lot of those things that I just named come naturally to children if they're left to their own devices. And a lot of those things I just named are very policed and very much not allowed in a great deal of childcare settings and in a great deal of homes. So I think that some children become very intense in their connection needs, specifically because they are trying to stick with a type of self-regulation strategy that is allowed even if it is very exhausting or overwhelming to their adults. They know that yelling wouldn't be allowed. Throwing things wouldn't be allowed. Running away wouldn't be allowed. Wrestling might not be allowed. Going ah, when your parent tells you to do something might not be allowed. So they cling because staying close to an adult means the adult's regulated nervous system will help their nervous system stay regulated. And staying close to an adult means that the adult will help solve the problems that the child faces because the adult is close by and you're never off by yourself trying to have to face down the overwhelm and the frustration on your own. So some parents might suspect that our child might be staying super, super close to us because our regulated nervous system is helping regulate their nervous system. It could be a good idea to look at the environment and try to see if there's something that could be making your child anxious or if there are expectations in their environment that it could be appropriate to let go of in order to let our child learn a new way to self-regulate. They could be encountering this at home. They could be encountering this at school. They could not really even be personally encountering this, but just be like afraid of it because they feel like that's the way that adults treat kids. Um, if our kid knows that they'll get in trouble, like I said, for sighing and rolling their eyes, then they know they don't have access to expressing your emotional experience uh, you're expressing your emotions through like a deep breath and a deep sigh and a, and a physical, you know, um, uh, expression on your face and they have to rely on something else. I find this to be more common in schools than it is in homes. I find that I'll, I'll have teachers consult with me and they're feeling like they've got a kid who's super duper clingy and wants to walk next to them in the hallway and wants to hold their hand in the hallway. And in the classroom, they kind of want to stand next to the teacher and they're not even realizing the way that the school's level of demand and expectations is meaning that the child can't explore any other means of regulation, even childish regulation, even immature regulation. All they have access to is clinging to a regulated adult. Okay, a final few practical suggestions. So 
I know that the thought of trying to cling to your child even harder than they're currently clinging to you might make you feel just tapped out to even hear me say it with my mouth. Hear me out. Here's what you do. Resolve in your mind an amount of time. Three days sounds about right to me. Maybe it doesn't sound quite right to you. I would try to do more than one day if you can so that it starts to feel like a pattern. And during this three-day experiment, you try to be even closer to your child than they always try to be to you. Whatever that looks like for your specific child at their specific age and at the specific developmental stage that they're in. If they would usually follow you to every room in the house, maybe you offer to carry them with you to the next room in the house. If they would ask you to sit on the couch with them and watch their favorite show, you sit on the couch so that your leg is touching them or sit them in your lap. If you would usually wake them by like shaking their shoulder and calling their name, maybe you wake them by like crawling into the bed next to them and putting your face next to them on the pillow and calling their name and telling them you love them and it's time to wake up. If you would usually try to slip out of the room when they're like focused on their play and otherwise occupied, you might try telling them, hey, I'm going to walk over here and do laundry now. Do you want to come? Maybe if they would usually try to eat your food, you preemptively offer to share it with them or even offer to feed them. Okay. I get that some of these things might feel ridiculously close and way more lovey or mushy or whatever than you are comfortable with because of all those lenses we looked at earlier, the way you were raised, the feelings you're having about your own body, all of that. It is okay if you feel that way. You are not a bad parent if you feel that way. And you can also keep reminding yourself in your head, it's just three days, it's just three days, it's just three days. You're trying to give them the greatest, loveliest, most connected three days that you possibly can you can manage it for three days. Here's an important caveat. If you cannot manage it for three days, <laughs> that is okay too. You are still not a bad parent. You are probably a very exhausted and tapped out parent. That's okay. I am not judging you, I promise. This is a tricky thing to set out to do. Here's what I see it do when it works. The kid and the adult have gotten into a pattern where the kid knows that invisibly the parent is pulling away from them or wishes, even if they're not doing it, wishes that they could pull away from them. So the kid is amping up and up and up and trying to connect with them as much as hard as often as they possibly can. And the adult might be allowing it or going with it or giving into it, but the kid isn't feeling it ever be reciprocated, initiated the other way. This gives them three days of being overwhelmed in a good way, in, in the good sense of the word, in reverse, overfilling their connection needs cup. And then after the three days are over, then you can taper it back off or just observe, or see what happens, or see how it felt for you, or see was it, you know, maybe you keep the bedtime thing, but you, but you let go of the food thing, or, or, or just see how it is that you guys both feel. My second suggestion is to spend a full day paying attention to how often you say your child's name in a day, or how often you call them to get their attention, or say a pet name, or whatever. You could use your phone and write a note on your phone. Maybe you could write tally marks on your hand, keep a pen in your pocket. Maybe keep a little post-it note. Whatever it is, really, really pay attention. How many times, how often are you saying their name or getting their attention in order to just share delight over something or tell them something that made you think of them or tell them something happy? I don't mean like praising them constantly, like good playing with your blocks, good Minecraft. I just mean sharing human delight. I mean, telling them a thought or a joke or a funny thing that you saw or enjoying something that you're doing versus how often are you getting their attention in order to correct them or to tell them to stop something or to give them a request or a demand or a job to do. I am not, again, making any judgment at all here. I know when my kids are having a fantastic day and if things are going well for them and they're playing well together and they're not needing me, I'm much more likely to just silently observe and never tell them like, how cool I think they are and how fun it is to watch them enjoy things. I'm like more likely to write a reflection about it on my Facebook page and tell 150,000 people that I don't know than I am to tell my kids like, I really love watching you guys play. So then they never know that I spend so much of my time like legitimately enjoying their existence. They only know when they come to me and make a bid for connection. So this is another way of doing the thing that I described in the first one paying attention to how often I verbally reach out for connection with them rather than waiting for them to come to me. And then my third suggestion is also on the same theme. 
uh, I borrowed the name special time and the, and the description, I borrowed the whole thing, uh, from hand in hand parenting, which is a, a website and a resource that you can look up. They describe this concept really thoroughly, but, uh, this is just a real, real brief primer on it. Uh, special time. The idea is that you set aside predictable one-on-one -on -one time each day for your child. Call it your name and their name. Like this is summer and mom's special time. My kid is summer. I don't mean the month. Uh, the the time of year, summer and mom special time. Set a timer for it and then don't look at your phone or let yourself get distracted or interrupted by anything else. Whether that means that you do it for only 10 minutes because that's what you can carve out. Like that, do 10 minutes every day rather than do an hour on Monday and then be burned out. It's very probable that at the end of the first few special times, they won't be happy that it's time to be done and for you to do something else. But the more times that they have to get used to it and that you hold consistent and you come back and you initiate it again the next day and you're initiating it and you're affirming that you, that I love summer and mom special time. I'm so excited for summer and mom special time tomorrow. I'm sad that it's over. I know I'm also sad that it's over. What are we going to do tomorrow? We could think about it. I'm going to go do the dishes now and you can tell me what you think about it or, or whatever it is. The more that they can trust that they can rely on it, the more powerful that it can be. Okay, I'm almost at my time. So here's the last little bit that I wanted to share with you. I think that a hugely important part of this whole piece of this puzzle is trying to make time for yourself in whatever way you possibly have to carve it out. And I know you're like, oh, wow, I should spend time doing things I like. Wow, shocking, great advice. What, like, <laughs> I'm hopefully gonna be able to give you a couple of practical ways to, to pursue that, whether that just means time outside, time being silent, time late at night, time early in the morning, time to be creative, time to do a hobby, whatever it is that nourishes you, whatever it is. The easiest way to do that, obviously, is to be able to leave your kids in the care of another person, partner, school, daycare, babysitter, grandparent, whatever it is. And also, obviously, everybody doesn't have great access to another person or people that they can lean on. Um, so a couple of ways that you can get your kids super invested into something in order to try to buy yourself a little bit of time. Um, screen time is a good one. People paint screen time as if it's all one thing painted with one brush and it's not. That's one of my pet peeves. You can download a new app. You can find a new show, find a new movie, create a YouTube playlist, um, whatever it is that you think will hold your child's interest for a little while to buy yourself some time to nourish yourself and climb a little bit back out of a slump. I think that everybody's needs in the whole family are important. And I think that screens are a tool, not a demon to avoid. Like some people on the internet sometimes make them sound like they are. Um, exciting play, sometimes even messy play, depending on how old your kids are, what developmental stage they are. You might be able to put them outside or put them in the bathtub. Um, I've talked on my website before about the difference between, to me, wet mess and dry mess. Wet mess is a lot harder for me and usually needs adult supervision, but dry mess with my kids at the ages that they're at might need less supervision. If I give my kid um, a new uh, pack of like uh, uh, 20 paper cups that I got from the store, like the kinds you would buy for a party, and I just give him the pack of them, well, I know that if I leave the room, I'm going to come back and there's going to be 20 paper cups all over the floor, but I also know that I can pick up 20 paper cups and chuck them to the side. Like it's not like they've ground glitter into the ground or slime. And so, uh, so, uh, thinking of something that's exciting, new novel, um, that can buy you a little bit of time that kind of blends into the third one, creative play, play with new materials, beads, pom-poms, pipe cleaners, glue, cool kinds of fabric, recyclables, cardboard boxes, loose bits and pieces, um, things that your child doesn't normally have access to, and whether or not you could just set them up with them and then take a few minutes away or take a few minutes to cultivate that parallel play idea. My kids have gotten hours of play in our back garden because I've bought like one bag of ice cubes because they just find ice cubes incredibly intriguing because we don't usually have ice cubes around. Same for like a bottle of water. Like a, I take a bottle and after I've drank it, I refill it and I put like one drop of blue food coloring in it. And now it's like an amazing thing to make potions with. And then I can sit on a bean bag and read a book and uh and cultivate the idea that we can both be playing we can both be close and also I don't have they don't have to have my physical attention every second sometimes visual novelty can buy you some time if your kid had like a previously favorite toy and now they're always overlooking it these days sometimes if you swap its location in the house or set it up to look inviting or funny in some way 
Sometimes I arrange things into a smiley face. Sometimes I stick a little post-it note on something that says like, play with me or like, I miss you or like whatever, just like a, a silly little thing or uh, combining two things. So we had a mini trampoline in our house for a while. And if I put uh, a bear on the trampoline as if it were jumping on it, then my kids would be about 20 times more likely to play with both the bear and the trampoline when both of those things were just like discarded in a corner before. You can set up an activity for your child during their bedtime or nap time so that when they wake up, they will see it and get invested in it. You might feel like I would just rather use the bedtime or nap time to catch up on time to myself, which is totally fair and makes complete sense. It's a little bit more of a playing the long game kind of strategy. I used to do kind of all of these things that I've just named, uh, set up a, a, a bag of, of paper cups or set up a, a, a funny thing like a stuffed animal doing something or a thing with a smiley face on it or stuff like that after my kids go to bed. So that first thing in the morning, I can have a little bit more time uh, to be like waking up, having my breakfast, getting my brain even turned on at all. And they have something that's immediately novel to um, to play with or to gravitate towards instead of them waking up and being like, I will sit on your head because I missed you all night. So that's helpful for me personally. And uh, you could always swap it around to whatever it is that feels like the the toughest time for you. So I hope that this is both practical and theoretical in kind of enough of a balance where um, I gave examples that uh, you could, you know, do tomorrow, but also that if I didn't touch on exactly the thing that, um, that, that, you know, you're worried about or you're thinking about, you could still take these ideas and be able to carry them over, plug in your exact scenario and find something that might work for you and your family. But I also saved a little bit of time here at the end so that um, hopefully I can address some of the specific concerns that you guys have as well. Yeah, and we have a couple of questions. So um, thanks so much for that. Lots of um, in the chat saying that they were just delighted to be here and getting all this information. So thank you for sharing that. The personal stories are also great. Um, so one parent uh, wants to know if they try the out clinging uh, suggestion with their child, what happens after the three days? Is their child just going to want that level of interaction or do they revisit the, the, the clinging, you know, once a month or something? How do you approach that? That's a really good question. And I, um, I encountered it in my own brain when I was writing this because I wrote an idea about bedtime. And then I erased it because I thought if I did that, my kid would, that would be the new pattern forever. Like that would be, um, that would never stop. If I started a bedtime, uh, pattern, it would never stop. And so I would say that, um, I would say that one thing is I, um, even as much as I talked about being able to say to yourself, this is just for three days, this is just for three days. I would do no individual thing that made me feel resentful even for five minutes. Like, like, um, when I'm talking about saying to myself, this is just for three days. I mean like the sum total of the emotional burden, but I don't mean like, I hate this. I wish you weren't touching me right now. Like, you know, I can't bear this. Like if, if anything makes me feel that way, that's never in my, that's never part of it for me. So bedtime is a real big trigger for me because of, uh, basically every single one of the lenses that I talked about earlier. And so because of that, um, I wouldn't put in a bedtime thing that I didn't feel comfortable replicating. So if um, it, it, the the difference to me would be if I was saying to my kid uh, for three days, like, uh, hey, I'm going to go do laundry. Do you want to do you want to take your toys and come with me? And um, every single time they were saying, yes, I do. Like I want, I would rather move my little diorama that I've set up in the playroom and come and carry it into the uh, washing room and, and put it down next to you uh, and then pick it back up and carry it all back in here and put it back down where my usual was. I'll try to slip out of the room, put the stuff in the dryer and then slip back into the room before she's noticed that I'm gone. If I set a new pattern, it's not like a devastating pattern for either of us. It might be slower. It might seem to me like, wow, this is a whole lot of effort. You have to move 15 tiny little plastic cats every single time that I go do laundry. Is this really what you want out of your life? But, but it doesn't, um, the ones that, the, the ones that stay important to them, I would think that probably, uh, I would think that probably not every single thing that you did in a bid to out clingy them not every single one of them would be the most important thing to them. It could be if your kid is in a real, real, uh, 
kind of a um, uh, connection deficit and they really, really, really need a lot. Or And I don't even mean that in a blamey way. That sounded too blamey, which is why I was thinking so hard about what words to say. If your kid has a really, really, really deep cup and they are really, really, really needing a lot to fill it. And, you know, you are initiating 20 new things and all 20 of them are the most important thing to them. That is possible. I would think it would be more likely that maybe five of them would be the most important thing to them. And, and then if you carry forward those ones that are more important, maybe that is a pattern that works for you guys. And if not, you could say, you know, um, uh, uh, I say to my, I, um, picking them up is a big example for me because, um, my kids are huge and tall and big. And, um, and, um, and I will say to them, like, uh, I, I can't pick you up today, babe. And, and she'll be like, you picked me up yesterday. You carried me upstairs yesterday. And I'll be like, I know. And my body is out of energy today. Um, I will hold your hand and walk with you. Or, um, you know, we can both crawl up the stairs like cats or whatever it is. And so if my child was con continuing to hope and insist on uh, a thing that I, that I set up, I would just uh, figure out the way that I wanted to word my explanation of why I couldn't keep doing that. And I talk a lot about my body's energy. Um, I talk a lot about my body's feelings. I talk a lot about my body's sensory stuff, although I don't say it in exactly those words. And so I think that that's also a good opportunity to practice modeling that language for our kids because um, my five-year-old has started to, <laughs> my five-year-old has started to uh, repeat some of it back to me. And I think that having that language is super helpful because I've said to her a few times, I can't, I can't do that today, babe. I don't have the energy. And she's like, you don't ever have energy. And I was like, I know, babe, kids have this much energy and adults have this much energy. And I used this much energy, uh, playing Danny go with you earlier. And now I don't have any more energy left. It went like this. And so then, uh, then the other day she went, mom, your energy went like this. And I was like, it did. <laughs> so I was sitting on the ground watching her play instead of getting up and dancing with her. Um, mm -hmm. So I feel like, sorry, that was real meandery. Um, I feel like what I would say is, uh, number one, some of the things might, some of the things out of the over clinginess might be good to keep carrying forward. Number two, if your kid needs every single one of those, then um, there might be, you know, some other way to help start meeting their those connection needs or, or something else to look at um, for them for that. And number three, um, even if you are starting to say no to some of the ones, it might give you the opportunity to uh, share some language around um, what your needs are and how you have fluctuating capacity on different days because everybody has fluctuating capacity on different days. And um, and I think all of that can be helpful too, even if it's even if it's hard, like even if experiencing it is hard. I hope that that makes sense. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Um, so there's a few more. Um... One of them is a parent saying, you know, if a child is dis dysregulated, is it best to allow them um, to allow that behavior to play out or to intervene with a regulation strategy? Like, what's the best idea there? Yeah. So I wonder if that's in response to like the, um, uh, you know, like stomping is a regulation tool and and uh, is a regulation tool and, and all of that. And I would say that. Um, for, for one, you can't necessarily implement reg regulation. Like you can't be like, you can't, you can't voice that on another person or be like, we will now be in a state of regulation. <laughs> like it's just something that takes time. Um, just, to, just to add to that one, another person jumped in there and said like, and I'm getting dysregulated myself. So they wanted to add that, you know, absolutely. To the, yeah. So yeah. And I was even going to say, I feel like actually the biggest work for me, I, I don't still, I mean, currently, I mean, today, yesterday. So this is not like somewhere where I'm like, I've arrived and you're all on your way. No, we're all on our way. Um, uh, the biggest thing for me is keeping myself regulated. So if my kid is dysregulated, I talk about like, you know, um, um, uh, uh, a kid in a state of dysregulation and a caregiver in a state of regulation and the kid comes to match the caregiver. And that's true. The caregiver is probably also doing work on themselves at that time. They're not just like in, in a magical state of, you know, uh, nothing is phasing them. And so I immediately begin reminding myself, this isn't an emergency because it's loud does not mean it's an emergency. Do I have my earplugs in my pocket? Yes, I do. If I'm being realistic, they're actually probably already in my ears. Do I have, uh, you know, do I have any other tools that I need in order to get through this? 
okay, what do I need to do in order to get those? Is it safe for me to like step out of the room for one second? Or it, are we in such a state of crisis that I cannot step out of the room for one second? That's the difference between, you know, your kid is dysregulated and they're throwing things versus your kid is dysregulated and they're saying, oh, mom, like, okay, you can step out of the room if you need to. Um, and, and step back, I mean. Um, and so uh, if my kid is in a state of, I would uh, probably distinguish between a state of crisis and a state of emergency. If my kid is in a state of crisis, they are hitting, they are throwing. Um, uh, I am aware that exertion, proprioception, picking up a big heavy thing and throwing it provides uh, sensory regulation to the body and also still is not a safe strategy to do in the house with your family, you know? So I'm not, um, just because I can describe how that is a thing that humans instinctually reach for in an attempt to regulate themselves does not mean that I have to allow it. It means that I can understand it. And so um, uh, if my kid is dysregulated and in a state of crisis, then I'm probably going to be mitigating that crisis, such as holding my kid in a bear hug and sitting down is what we do a lot in my house with one kid. The other kid, I'm kind of shepherding them into a different room because my kids both need different things. Um, and, um, and, uh, but like, as far as like, should regulation be implemented right away? It's like, well, uh, my own regulation, I'm going to do everything that I can to, to cling on to that because I know that it will wear off on my child over time. As long as I don't make it worse. A lot of times I'm telling myself in my head, my job here is not to make it worse. My job here is not to be six and five. My job here is not to yell and throw things. My job here is uh, to be regulated and they will join me in regulation and they are not learning anything right now because the voice in my head will say they're learning they can get away with anything and they're learning blah, 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 blah and all that kind of stuff that we've heard. They're not learning anything right now except that their needs can be met. Logic is not even online for them right now. They're learning that I'm a safe person. They're learning that this is a safe household and that we keep everybody safe and that they are safe. And um, I write about this a lot. I write um, real in-depth, um, uh, like case study is a weird word for when it's with my own kids, but I write like breaking down, like this happened and this happened. And I was thinking this in my head and I was telling myself this and my kid did this and I reacted this way. Uh, so like a real in-depth, uh, uh, like like scenario and they're real scenarios um, and uh, put them on my Facebook or on my website. And I'm trying to remember if I have a tag that on my website that goes through all of those. And I don't think that I do have one tag, but if you look by dysregulation, you'll get a lot of them. Um, and I talk about my different, my, my two different children are very different. And so I do different things with the two of them. Um, cause I was trying to parent kid number two, the same way as kid number one, and it wasn't working. Um, and, um, uh, so I would say, uh, as far as like allowing behavior to play out, I would say I would not police small misbehavior or whatever I would like I wouldn't be like don't roll your eyes at me or don't talk to me in that voice or things like that if I can sense my kids dysregulation ramping up because that is me being dysregulated and jumping my dysregulation into theirs that's me being like hey it's making me feel attacked that you're talking to me that way let me yell at you about it and that's not going to help anybody regulate so um uh in terms of like letting it go then 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 uh yes but um hopefully that uh answers that yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, and then another person is asking, how can we learn all 16 types? I think they mean of play. So uh, did oh, you- Oh yeah, it's, I am um, blanking on the guy's name who it's his framework, but I, um, and I should have put that, I should have put that, that I didn't mean to like steal it or not reference it. But um, um, if you, let me see if Googling 16 types of play actually gets it. Uh, yeah, it does. So Bob Hughes, Bob Hughes is 16 types of play. Uh, the ones that I left out were, uh, things like, um, um, uh, symbolic play, um, uh, uh, ritualistic play. And so they are like, you know, like little kids will like on the playground and they'll like fully be like chanting and inventing potions. And you're like, oh my gosh, you've just like reinvented some kind of little cult over there so like thing, <laughs> things like that that kids do do instinctually and this is a description of of all of those things but they weren't necessarily relevant to the types of play that parents are usually engaged in with their kids but they are super interesting so uh definitely look it up 
great. And um, so there's another parent feeling like they're bad at play. And what advice do you have to a parent that kind of doesn't know what to do with themselves that wants to learn how to play? That's totally fair. And um, I would ask yourself uh, uh, whether in actual or in hypothetical, um, uh, like what you do for fun, um, uh, that might be, I don't even know, you know, because my kids take up so much of my time or whatever, which is why I said it could be in hypothetical, but imagine that you had a, a paid vacation and your kids were totally taken care of by the most magical, majestic person ever in the world. And they were completely safe and fine. And you had a week to yourself to do whatever you wanted to do. What is it you would do? And then it, try to seek to figure out how to categorize that. Even if the thing that you would do isn't, doesn't sound like it's a play form at all. If you're like, I would read a bunch of books. I mean, you can connect with your kid by reading books with them or by seeking out information or by learning how to research stuff at the library or by delving into podcasts or videos that you guys think are interesting. Kids are naturally like super curious. If you're like, um, you know, some kind of creative hobby or some kind of musical hobby or some kind of sportsy hobby or, um, or, um, uh, you know, you really just want to like, uh, uh, talk with people and hang out and, and communicative, uh, social type of play and things like that. So I think that, um, uh, the other part of that is that our kids usually won't be great at, um, like they don't meet us on our connection needs. We get those from somewhere else. So I don't mean this in the sense of like, figure out your hobby and then introduce your kid to your hobby and then expect them to be good at it. But I mean that you might be able to take clues from what it is that naturally interests you and then figure out how that can apply in a kid, a kid, uh, uh, directed type of way. I would also say that it's okay if you like, aren't super good. Like, it's okay to say to your kid, like, um, well, for one, it's okay to let them direct the play. Like, okay, what should I do? Okay. What does my guy say? Okay, now what do they do? Sometimes kids love that. They love being the director of it. Like you're like you're the actor and they're the director. Like sometimes that's super fun for kids. It's also okay to say like, I don't want to play blocks, but I would love to watch you and then legitimately watch them. Like don't use that as an excuse to like look at your phone. Um, because those are both also connective, like connecting ways. If you don't feel comfortable with playing with the thing, it's okay to with genuine, you know, um, like love and empathy be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to watch you be a cat. I don't really want to be a cat, but I would love to watch you be a cat and then watch them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. So the chat is just full of a lot of gratitude and of people saying that it was so helpful and validating and yeah, just such great information. Thank you so much for sharing. Awesome. Yeah. So just to say it again, because it has come up, but I think I think I have it right. It's occupational.com. Yes. Mm hmm. Okay. And, and am I right in thinking you can put in a little question in a search bar or like an issue in a search yes, bar? If you can, um, if you can, it's a lot better than Facebook at that. So it has almost every, it, if you read my Facebook, it has al almost everything there is the same, but it's categorized in lots of different ways. So one way is that there's a search bar. And if you can type in one keyword, not like a sentence. Um, so don't be like three-year-old is crying and hitting me. That won't probably find you anything. But if you, if you type, you know, crying, then you'll, then you'll get, or hitting, then you'll get something. Um, another way that you can do it is by just going to the home page, And then there's a bar across the top that says by age, by domain, by, uh, uh, setting, um, a, a lot of different things that are by something. And then when you mouse over them, then like, if you mouse over by age, then it says, babies, toddlers, preschoolers, elementary, they're kind of American centric um, words, but, um, and then you can like, so you can be like, oh, my kids are teens. I only want to read about teens. The third way that you can search it uh, is that there's a lot of tags on it too. And so um, if you, there's a tag bubble on the side of the homepage, or if you find an article that you already like and you scroll all the way to the bottom, there's a bunch of words that are in black squares and the black squares are all tags. And if you click on one, it will take you to every other article that is tagged with the same word. So if you read something and think this really resonated with me, then um, look at the bottom and see if it has tags that that have a keyword in them that had to do with why, why it resonated with you. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And that for the people commenting that the level of detail and just the, the amount of information that you share, like that, the, 
the, the Facebook posts are just so full of detail and it sounds like your website is also. So again, thank you so much. What a service you're providing for parents and um, really appreciate you coming out again. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so, thank you guys so much for, for having me. Um, it is, this was a really fun one to get to write uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about this topic. So yeah, great. Thanks so much, Kelsey. We'll see you again. Have a good night or day. Bye, everybody. Thanks everybody. for coming.